Serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome are high yield topics that can appear on your shelf or board exam. Because of their similarities and potential for many pharmacology questions, they are a favorite for examiners. So if you want to get major points on your exam, learn cool mnemonics, and do quizzes to test your knowledge, watch this video until the end. Hi, I'm Dr. LJ from MD Powerhouse. Serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome have overlapping features such as altered mental status and sympathetic hyperactivity. This sympathetic hyperactivity presents as fever, tachycardia, and hypertension. They may also experience diaphoresis. However, they differ by onset, key distinct features, and precipitants that could cause their respective syndromes. We're also going to look at these differences that can help you score higher on your shelf or board exam. Serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome can be distinguished by the onset of their symptoms. So serotonin syndrome, their symptoms occur within less than a day this can be remembered by the mnemonic so short, as you can see highlighted on this slide. However, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, these symptoms occur one to three days after the initiation of a drug, which are most commonly dopamine antagonists. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome can also occur one to three days after an increase in drug dose. So onset of symptoms are one way of distinguishing serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. However, another high yield way of distinguishing them is through distinct clinical features. These distinct features really help you differentiate serotonin syndrome from neuroleptic malignant syndrome. I used to confuse these a lot. So what helps me to remember is Santa Claus. So the S from Santa signifies the SS, which is serotonin syndrome, while the CL from Claus signifies clonus. That's why those letters are highlighted. But if you are more of a visual learner like myself, maybe this will help you remember. So here we see short Santa Claus. Short sure, means that there's a short time until the onset of symptoms. SS lets you know that we're talking about serotonin syndrome. And CL lets you know that we're talking about clonus that is seen in serotonin syndrome. And guys, if you like that Santa Claus mnemonic, comment Santa Claus in the comments below and to confuse anyone who sees this video's comment section. Clonus is a hyperreflexic state where you have continuous twitching of a muscle. So once you remember the Santa Claus mnemonic and what clonus means, it's easy to remember that neuroleptic malignant syndrome would be the opposite, which is hyporeflexia and lead pipe rigidity. If you can answer this question, then you will know why patients with serotonin syndrome experience diarrhea. So this question says, what metabolite can help in the diagnosis of serotonin syndrome? Let's think about it. Okay, let's go. So the answer is 5-HIAA. Remember carcinoid syndrome where you have diarrhea, bronchospasms, flushing, and right-sided heart lesions? Well, just like in carcinoid syndrome, there is an elevated 5-HIAA. So that's why these patients can have diarrhea. This is another way you can be tested on your shelf or board exam. It's high yield to know that serotonin drugs cause serotonin syndrome. But not only SSRIs or SNRIs can cause serotonin syndrome. We'll be doing questions to help you remember these high yield precipitants. 
Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, on the other hand, is caused by dopamine antagonists. So here we have another question to quiz what we've learned so far. So when answering questions, my technique is to read the last line or question before the clinical vignette. So the question or the last sentence says, which neurotransmitter is most likely to be dysregulated? So this lets me know that this is a two-step question that requires me to first know the diagnosis and then the pathophys. So let's read the clinical vignette to find clues of what the diagnosis could be. A 43-year-old man is brought to the emergency department by his brother. He has slept for two hours for the past week because he's trying to unlock the world's secrets. The patient becomes agitated and is hospitalized. He's prescribed medication to alleviate his symptoms. Three days later, he is no longer agitated, but he has difficulty moving. Physical exam reveals rigidity in his upper extremities and lower limbs. He also appears newly disoriented. His temperature 103, blood pressure 158 over 92, respiratory rate 20, and pulse rate 90. Okay, so the clues here are that we have a patient that appears to be in acute mania and receive medications that could be antipsychotics. And the exam findings of rigidity and the autonomic instability means that this is most definitely neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So dopamine antagonists cause neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So the answer is dopamine. Part two of this question can be answered by the information on the next slide. Guys, if you're liking this high yield pharmacology I'm about to talk about, then give this video a thumbs up. In the serotonin syndrome column, we can see that the first line has primarily antidepressants. Then we have linozolid, which is a 50S inhibitor and can be used to treat MRSA. It is a weak MAOI that can trigger serotonin syndrome. And then we see odansetron, which is a serotonin receptor antagonist that can be used to treat vomiting. For the last line, let's pretend that we can spell, and that is actually EAST. The E stands for ecstasy and ergos. The S stands for somatriptan and St. John's words. And the T stands for tramadol and trazodone. So remember that mnemonic we talked about earlier? The short Santa Claus? Well, now we're going to add the short Santa Claus flies east. This will help you to remember the distinct features of serotonin syndrome, the timing of onset of the symptoms, and the drugs that can cause it. The main drugs that can cause neuroleptic malignant syndrome are dopamine antagonists. Also, daptomycin is an antibiotic that disrupts the cell membrane that can also cause NMS. Here we can see another antiemetic. So, undansetron and metoclopramide are both antiemetics. But I remember that metoclopramide causes NMS because of the M's in both words. Now let's do another quiz. So again, I'm going to look at the last line here that says, what is the most likely diagnosis that can explain his symptoms? So this is just a one step question. So let's read to find out what's going on. A 52 year old man was given new medication by his family practitioner a day ago. He now presents to the emergency department with uncontrollable shaking. His temperature is 105.1, blood pressure 162 over 89, pulse rate 100, and respiratory rate 20. So the clues to the diagnosis are one, he started new meds a day ago. Two, 
he has uncontrollable shaking, which could be indicating clonus. And three, the autonomic instability with the elevated blood pressure and body temp. So the answer is serotonin syndrome. So this is part two of the same question. It says, what drug most likely precipitated his symptoms? This question requires you to know which drugs cause serotonin syndrome. So let's look at the options. A and C are dopamine antagonists, which cause NMS. Option B is the antibacterial that also causes NMS. And remember the M's. So metoclopramide causes NMS. That leaves us with option D. So that means the answer is linezolid. A patient was prescribed tramadol to manage his pain. What symptom may arise as a complication of this drug? So this question requires knowledge from the previous slide about precipitants. The patient is taking tramadol. So you have to know if that drug will cause NMS or SS. If you remember that Santa Claus flies east, you will get this correct. One of the T's in east stands for tramadol and the S in Santa stands for serotonin syndrome, while the CL stands for clonus. So the answer is D. Here is a bonus question for extra points on the exam. What is the most common renal complication of NMS? So if a patient took a drug and now presents with electrolyte disturbances such as hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia, and blood is detected on urine dipstick, but not on microscopy, meaning that there are no red blood cells seen on microscopy, then we should suspect rhabdomyolysis. There can also be an elevation in creatinine kinase and white blood cells. And that brings us to the end of this topic. If you have any cool mnemonics to help remember this topic, leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, power up the like button and hit subscribe. To continue learning high yield content, click this video right here.